him in such a deep meditation that one of the masters who was there from the beginning came in. You get a click at the back of your neck, by the way, it goes like that. And then they appear. So he said, I want you to open your, uh, I'm going to give you a metaphor and I want you to open your eyes and write it down. Um, he said, okay. He said, so here is the metaphor. The truth of the triangle is the power of the pyramid. And so I opened my eyes and I went to write it down, but instead of writing it down, he was, his soul energy was standing right in front of me. I, it was me, the coffee table, and he was on the other side. Now his soul was this big and the inner core, which went from floor to ceiling, was all a uh, white light with giant prismatic ovals of gold. Right? You got to accentuate the positive. Wow! I feel good. A little bit of feel good goes a long way. You're listening to Karen Swain, teacher of deliberate creation, accentuating the positive, showing you a way to a better life. Accentuating the positive, it's not just fad, it's sanity. Who in their right mind would accentuate anything else? If you feel like that's what you want to do. Hello and welcome to another show, Accentuating the Positive with Karen Swain. As always, wonderful to be with you all again. And please remember if you're liking the shows to subscribe and, you know, do all that great stuff, like, leave me a comment. I say this every show, but it is great to hear from you all. As you know, I've been getting very galactic since the Higher Self Expo, where we spoke about where science meets spirituality and... I can't wait for today's show. I've got the fabulous <laughs> Craig Campobasso with us today. Welcome to the show, Craig. Thank you. So happy to be here, Karen. <laughs> Darling, you've got an amazing story. So for people who don't know about you, uh, I'm going to read a little bit of your bio and, sure. then, and then we're going to get into it. Multi-award winning filmmaker and Emmy nominated casting director, Craig Campobasso, <laughs> Italian last name, you've got to say it's Italian accent. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> was 15 when he started in the entertainment business. He began his casting career on Steven Spielberg's Amazing Stories, a career which spans three decades. Craig's mother, Marie Donna King Campobasso, told him from the time she was pregnant that she knew he'd be a writer. He fulfilled that prophecy when he was 26 after he had experienced a life-changing spiritual awakening. That's when the autobiography of an extraterrestrial saga, a book series, was born, which is four books in the series at the moment, isn't it, Craig, or is there more? Yes, there, it's four, and I'm working on the fifth and sixth right now. And you want to have about seven, right? I want to have seven in total. Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. We're going to talk about that. Yeah. Craig's passion is to write stories that provoke the reader to think, to raise their consciousness, to expand their mind about creation while still being entertained in that Hollywood tradition. Craig directed and wrote and produced a short film called Stranger at the Pentagon, which was adapted from a popular UFO book authored by the late Dr. Frank E. Strangers. The short film collected many accolades, and I can't wait to see the extended version of it. I'm like hankering to see the extended version of it. Uh, I've watched the short film and I'm like, no, I want more. Anyway, his latest book is The Extraterrestrial Species Almanac. An Ultimate Guide to Greys, Reptilians, Hybrids and Nordics. And that was released on January 1st of this year, 2021. This is an ultimate field guide to 82 extraterrestrial species that populate the universe. Craig explores the origins, physical characteristics, technical and conscious abilities, dimensional capacities, belief systems, and cosmic agendas of each species. 
you know what I want to know? How do you know all this stuff about the species? Oh, I'll tell you when we get there. <laughs> okay. okay. Remind me. <laughs> I will. I will. <laughs> okay. The species fall into two categories. Benevolent races, which function as the guardians of humanity, whose goals include helping people, overcoming duality, healing, and you say protection. Yeah, we need mm -hmm. protecting. Huh. Yes. And then you've got the malevolent species, which are responsible for abductions, cloning, and ultimate domination. Ultimate domination. Hmm. Yeah, we'll mm -hmm. chat about that too, because I've got something to say about that, having spoken to a lot of people on the shows sure. who've had abductions. And, you know, sure, they were scary and horrific to start with, but then they realised that they're actually a part of the race that are abducting them and that elected to come into a human body and be a part of the programs that they're, you know, using the human body and DNA. So even though it was horrific and horror movie at the beginning, then it sort of turned mm -hmm. into oh, hang on, I signed up for all this. So, yes, so, so that is the case in some cases. Okay. Most cases, but that's not always the case. Okay, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> the intergalactic expose will entertain all those interested in the UFO, aliens, and sci-fi, uh, like, like movies such as the Marvel series, Star Trek, and stuff like that, and delve deep into who the real extraterrestrials are and what they want uh, with the people of Earth. You can find out more at strangeratthepentagon.com or autobiographyofaet.com. Okay, yeah, here's... Um, here, yeah. I've, uh, on a n e t dot com. Oh, on yeah, a n e t. Yes, yes. I, I I had to shorten it a little. <laughs> who wants to type? Who wants to type in autobiography of an extraterrestrial? Right. You could have made it a n e t or a n e t. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Here's where I want to start. I want to know the about the life changing spiritual awakening. What? Happened? Sure. Well. I, you and know, don't hold back. <laughs> I won't. I won't. When I went, you know, I grew up like a normal, you know, a normal kid. I wanted to be in the film business and that kind of thing. So uh, out of high school, um, I graduated at 17 and moved out of my parents' house and was already self sufficient, right? Uh, having jobs and things like that. So, um, so I worked at a film company during the day. And then uh, after I worked there for a little bit, um, one of the owner's best friend's sister was working on David Lynch's Dune, the movie. And this is like 19, late 79, 1980, somewhere in there. So uh, they highly recommended me for to work there, um, which I did. And I ended up working on the movie for four years. So I learned all about filmmaking and everything uh, while uh, uh, being there. Very excited for the new Dune to come out October 22nd. And um, if anybody are Dune fans, they are re-releasing the original Dune on 4K. And they interviewed a lot of us who were behind the scenes for a very long time, uh, of which I am one of them to tell our stories for the making of. So people, you know, get by it or watch it, they'll be able to hear me and many other people. So, so I was, uh, so after that, I went to work on Amazing Stories um, and as Amazing Stories second season was ending, I always say my own amazing story began, right? So I, I just a normal guy. I wasn't into science fiction. I wasn't into a lot of things. I went to work. I went out on the weekends like everyone else. I slept in late on the weekends. That's, I was just like, you know, I, I uh, wasn't in a 
uh, in a major spiritual frame of mind thinking about spirituality at all, although it was already innate in me as I look back, because it was already innate in my mother, right? So, so, I, so what began is a sequence of events where one night I dreamed I was standing before two extremely tall beings wearing robes that had all of these little minuscule tiny sun cells in them. And it was like a computer and it was, it was, had depth to it. And these things moved at will and they, and later I would come to find out that they could call upon any place in creation by using a sun cell from wherever they were thinking of and they can pull the information from that sector of the universe at will, right? Amazing, they're, they're like ultra terrestrials, ultra angels. I mean, uh, it's hard to describe them except for, uh, and there was a, a woman, a blonde woman as well. And all they would do was I would just feel love and I'd wake up and I'd go, oh, that was interesting. You know, and I'd say, I wonder who they were. And then it'd be gone. And it happened almost every night for two months. Right. And I would say, oh, oh. And then in the next two months, I would all of a sudden wake up in the dream realizing my soul was somewhere else and that this was reality and I was really standing before them. It was a whole new experience. And so this went on for another two months. And then in the next two months, the same experience would happen. But when I would wake up, I would see their astral forms at the foot of my bed and they would just be smiling. Now, I, it, it, was, it was one of those things where in the moment I would say, wow, they're so beautiful. These beings are so incredible. Um, all I'm feeling is this immense love and my body would just be so warm and, and you know, when you wake up from a really good night's rest and your body is just in this nirvanic yeah. state, mm -hmm. that's what it was like, right? So, no, what's weird is it wasn't like I, there was never a freak out moment or anything because they seem so familiar. Right. And it was like, I would be in the moment of the contemplation and then it would just be washed away until it happened again, mm. right? Mm. So anyway, so then the next phase was I again, after, after these six months have gone through, I again appeared where they were and then they, then they had their palms up like this and this white golden light with star particles, they were feeding this light into my body and I was floating and turning in the circle of them. And I just, I mean, I went into such a state again of nirvana and I woke up in my room and I just, I could not believe the feeling it, that I was experiencing. It was like I was floating. I had never experienced anything like that before in my life. And then what happened over the next eight months was I saw the beauty behind the creation of everything on the planet, a person, a plant, a, a ladybug, whatever what was in front of me, I could feel its vibration. I could understand its soul history. And it was so beautiful to me that I sobbed literally every day between eight and 12 times. And I'm not talking about crying, sobbing, profusely sobbing. 
I mean, I got to a point where I was so worried, I didn't think I would ever be able to stop, right? And um, anyway, um, so, so what this was is this, um, well, I'll tell you the experiences and I'll tell you why they happened. So, so I, I go through this eight month thing and then the next thing is to ignite my light body and uh, and I actually woke up during this activation when it was in my bedroom where the blonde uh, female uh, was holding on to my ankles. And I woke up and my body was going all the way up like this and slamming back down onto the bed, but nothing was hurting me. Right, it was like there was some kind of cushion or something that was there. And I knew in that instant, cause I turned like this and I could see that it was her. And she uh, then went like this and touched my leg and I went back to sleep. And when I woke up in the morning, I knew that something had happened. So the 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 first six months is getting is getting a preliminary preparation of what my work on this planet would be then it was to activate myself to cleanse this body and to allow the energies from uh from the, the higher intelligences to work through me so that they would have a clear vehicle, right? And then the activation of the light body after that time, I started astral traveling to other worlds at night. Many people will do this. This is not a, any strange thing. You know, a lot of people, uh, if they're not into this, they look at me you know, uh, like it's strange, but it's not strange. It happens. Uh, I've been in doing this since I was 26. I'm 61 now. Wow. And the thing is, is that um, I have had lots and lots and lots of experiences working with this because at that time, what also happened is they opened up my mind internet into the universe. Okay, okay. I, I, I want to ask you this. Yeah. Because I, I get it. I get that, you know, many, probably all of us are having these unbelievable astral adventures at night. And I know I am. Yes. But I don't remember. So I'm thinking that all that stuff that you went through, you opened up your mind to the internet of life, opened up your mind to the internet of life so that when you do come back into your physical third dimensional experience you do remember well you, you do you do but when i would meditate during the day mm -hmm. right they would come to me or i would go to them so as i'm looking at you now on my inner eyelids a being from somewhere would pop in and would telepathically talk to me it could have it could be something simple it could be nothing but the expression of sending the feeling of love. And, and, and a lot of it was being thankful for the job that I was taking on, you see, because when I was going through all these experiences, I, I kept a journal and I was writing a book about them, right? And so after all the many different experiences happened, and, and I'll tell you one more, there's many more, but they are all detailed in book two of the Autobiography of an Extraterrestrial Saga. So, um, but one day in the, around noon, I'm meditating on the couch. I have all the windows open, it's bright, it's light. And I am in such a deep meditation. Um, that one of the masters who was there from the beginning came in. You get a click at the back of your neck, by the way. It goes like that. And then they appear, right? And he said, um, 
I and they always made me carry around a, a pad and paper wherever I went because I never knew when I was going to receive information. I do that to this day. Everywhere, every room, <laughs> even in my car, everything has it. I have little talky things, everything. Um, because once it comes through you and you forget it, it might not come back, right? <laughs> so, so he said, I want you to open your, uh, I'm going to give you a metaphor and I want you to open your eyes and write it down. And I said, okay. But I was in the, the flow and um, the bliss of the meditation that I stayed in it and I did not open my eyes. And five minutes later, I, I couldn't believe that I didn't do that. And so I called him back and he came back and he said, um, he said, okay. He said, so here is the metaphor. The truth of the triangle is the power of the pyramid. And so I opened my eyes and I went to write it down, but instead of writing it down, he was, his soul energy was standing right in front of me. I, it was me, the coffee table, and he was on the other side. Now his soul was this big and the inner core, which went from floor to ceiling, was all a uh, white light with giant prismatic ovals of gold, right? Very shades, and then it was all gold light, and it was like <laughs> you could you could hear the thing, and it went like this. And I, I mean, I'm getting chills right now because it's something you never forget. And, and I was so blessed to have experienced that. And, and then he just sort of danced around the living room. And then in that particular apartment I lived in, I had a portal at the bottom of my bed, one in the hallway and one in the living room. And then he went up the portal. And of course, then I wrote it down. So, so when I had finished, you know, I had finished this book and, um, and I went to Mount Shasta and while I was there, um, uh, I had another big experience with the great I am, which is where I would learn that two of the original masters that came to wake me up were from. Right? So they're from the first world created in the first super universe. We're in super universe seven, they're in super universe one, right? This, I mean, you can't even imagine the scope of all of creation, right? Like none of us can imagine the scope, but we can because we are a part of it if we really allow ourselves to, to an extent until we get back into our perfection body, right? But anyway, um, so I came back from this trip and I was meditating on what I should do with the book. And of course he came back into my meditation and he said, what would you say if I told you, you just wrote that book for yourself? And I said, then I learned a lot about myself. He said, now it's time to write the real books that you came here to write. I want you to sit down at the table and I want you to write and write and write and write until you can write no more. Don't stop, don't edit, keep going. If you think something sounds strange, don't worry about it. If you don't know a word, say, spell it, we'll spell it for you. That happened on many occasions. Right. And I would look it up in the dictionary and go, oh, wow, that really is a word. Right. And um, so so um, so that's when I began to uh, write uh, the autobiography of an extraterrestrial saga, which basically is um, it's a story of a Pleiadian man whose name is Tehran. And Tehran is seven foot seven. He's a Titan. 
And he was born dualistic in a realm where everyone is fully conscious. So they, to they tell me that every 200,000 births, there is a dualistic child that is born and that this is how the universe keeps a balance also within the, um, uh, within the fully conscious uh, community because they are now dealing with somebody who is dualistic. And so therefore they can help this person achieve um, their chakra activation to become a fully conscious being by merging their seven lower and five upper chakras and how that works. They, they gave me the, how all of that works and the activations and all of that, which I found extremely fascinating. Um, and uh, anyway, there, so, so I, I just started learning about all of these things. And then, and then I started learning, they started teaching me about the whole starseed program that comes out of the University of Melchizedek, which is the universe's school. It's, it's 490 university planets in the mirror system that go from one end of the galaxy to the other. And that Tehran was appointed a teacher to teach starseeds who are coming into earth. So he teaches them all the different things about who they're going to be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He also teaches the mighty messengers who are going to be coming in um, because the mighty messengers have gone through a program, Tarona had to go through this program here on earth as well, where you are every race, male, female, every sexuality, every everything. Um, and sometimes the, they explain the lives would be short, they might pass at 20 to 30 because they already achieved what they needed to achieve, right? Uh, in, in the schooling. So, so when all of that is done and then, so what they're doing is they're raising consciousness in a, in rural areas where they live and they're helping to raise everyone else because they're, they've come here, they're already fully conscious beings who are being incarnated into a dualistic world so their spirituality will kick in at a certain point and they will gobble up spiritual information, become great spiritual beings in their own right. And that is how the consciousness is raised. Now the mighty messengers come in and they, they do it on a global scale, right? So right. That, that could be, you know, that could be anyone from Gandhi to George Lucas, right? So <laughs> Gandhi to George Lucas. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No. Let me just let me just pause for a sec there. Let me just stop at the star seeds because as you're talking, I'm just getting all these faces. And one of them is my 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 nephew, who's yes. like 20. And you couldn't teach him at school. He did not do 3D school, right? And I've often said that these dyslexic unteachable kids they come in to change the education system because our education system is so bad you know yes. and he, he's totally psychic and totally creative he's now an artist crazy artist and he had an art exhibition recently and um he, he's you know he's visited me many times and i've had chats with him about who he is anyway and when i came to the art exhibition he had a friend and he goes oh this is my man auntie Karen. she reckons i'm an alien from another planet here to save the world <laughs> <laughs> that's great <laughs> <laughs> and he was laughing oh. he he's so not awake and yet he's so loving yeah. Yes, yes. And everyone is on a different timetable. Sometimes oh. they're 12. Mm -hmm. um, I know, I know some kids when they were 12, uh, two boys when they were 12 and 15, fully awake. Mm -hmm. um, one could write, uh, speak five star languages. Um, 
they they had the capability to know physics they knew everything yeah. under the sun but their parents were hugely spiritual advanced star seeds so they had okay. a vehicles to come through to to bring their full energies through right so right. that's another part of the star seed program the more and more they keep incarnating in star seeds, incarnating through higher spiritual things. More of that spiritual essence can come through the uh, uh, through the incarnate. So, but yeah, a lot of that is um, true. And and you know, sometimes a star seed might may never wake, but still continue to do what they came here to do. And sometimes they will wake and and wake hugely. Yeah. Right. And as you were talking, I'm thinking about teenage suicides, teenage deaths, a lot of kids who are really sensitive that just can't deal with this world. And I don't know, I think as humans, we get so caught up in the drama of it all and so upset. And sometimes that drama is the plan, right? It's yeah, the plan. right. Right. Uh, sure. You know, they've come, they leave at 20, 17, 18, 19 because that's they've come for that amount of time and they did what they needed to do and actually their death is waking up people like sure. so people yes. start saying well what happens when you die and maybe that was the plan so them committing suicide and yeah so yeah. right really yeah mm. there it is it's it's all extremely interesting and fascinating and all of that but so, you know, so those books arrived and, and it was just learning all about the universe, the setup of the universe, how the, they are raising our planet up into universal society so that we can be with them again. Wow. And, um, and, and this is a planet of focus really, really intensely. There are so many races that are here, positive races that are helping, that are gonna bring this planet up and out of this darkness that it's going through. And it still will go through whatever, but it's already, um, it's already going to be a planet of peace again once we, you know, once we all get through this. And I look at it like this, we're, we're all here, we're all a part of the plan. We just keep sticking to our things. And, um, and you know, you can do it peacefully too. You can just do it through meditation, putting good thoughts out, that kind of thing that changes energy, uh, sometimes a lot more than getting out there with an anger with anger and a picket sign yeah, so. instead of getting caught up in the rhetoric of the human drama that's unfolding now we can have conversations like this right you can get together yes. with your friends you can talk about space and extraterrestrials yeah. you don't need to get caught up in the human drama that's unfolding as as the world is changing but what right. i want to ask you is you know when who was it that came to you and said what do you think about all the information that you're writing down? Do you think it's just for you? What was the name of that being? Well, the, the two beings were, the, all three beings were Moyava, mm -hmm. Jacobaba, uh -huh. and Eris. And Eris. Eris. Eris, was, Eris was the female human. E-R-I-S. Right? No, A-R-R-I-S. A-R-R-I. Right. Yeah, and actually in the books, um, I had art, uh, all the books are fully illustrated because I was, got to go to these places astrally in my mind or astral traveling at night. Yeah. So I could see them. So I found a actual extraterrestrial artist that who is. connects into experiencers and I would sit with her and show her what to write. So each book has between 80 and 90 artist renderings. So, mm -hmm. so the, the Maramayams, who is Jacobova and Moyava, there are um, artist renderings of them. There are artist renderings of Eris. All of the beings, also Tehran, um, uh, everybody else in, in the whole thing, sometimes the interiors of their craft because they do different things and 
any kind of craft that uh, has been talked about, um, things of that nature. So, uh, so what I wanted to know was, he, he, whoever said that to you, he said, you just wrote that for you. Now we're right. going to give you stuff to put into books for others. Did you actually yes. put that information in the books that actually was supposedly just for you? The, no, the, it was just about my own experiences going through the waking up process. Mm -hmm. So that's right? not in the books. No, that's not, that's not in the books. Um, but it was a 400 page book. <laughs> as I recall, I think I have the manuscript somewhere around here, not, not written very well, <laughs> but, but nonetheless documented in that because I always kept journals of the dates and times and things when things happened. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. There's so much to talk about. Like this just yeah. so um, as we're traveling to other worlds, I wrote down the principle behind thought. Okay. I want to talk about, Val Thor, Dr. Strangers. But let's just jump into the new book for a second. Yeah. We go back to, I want to talk about, you know, Stranger at the Pentagon. So the new book, I asked you the question, how do you know all this information? Was it channeled? Did it was, you know, about all these species? Did they show themselves to you? How did that information come through? Well, um, the book wasn't my idea. It was my book agents. And because he knows of me, uh, being uh, in studying in the UFO community ever since I was 26, right? I've gone on lots of investigations with uh, ufologists. Um, I've talked with lots of contactees, abductees, experiencers. Um, I'm very close uh, with um, uh, Yvonne Smith and Barbara Lamb, who have done the most regressions in these areas as well, but also because of my connection to the autobiography of an extraterrestrial books, my agent called and said, look, I've got an idea for a book and I can sell it. And I, um, and you're the man to write it. And I said, well, what is it? And he goes, well, the title is The Extraterrestrial Species Almanac. And I said, oh, God, I'm in. I could write that book, right? And he said, okay, just make a proposal. And, um, and then I'll send it out. Well, he sold the book in four days literally that never happens and i said there must be a reason the universe wants this book out there right so now i've studied lots of cases and things over the years so i knew who all the contactees were i knew what those races were and things of that nature so after i signed on to do the book i contacted all those contactees or the authors like Wendell Stevens, Colonel Wendell Stevens alone investigated 65 different cases of which he created books. So I obtained permission to extract my favorite cases and use those. So for instance, when you're reading about a human race called the Clermers, who were also here on earth many, many times, you could go to the back of the book and you can learn that it, the book was called UFO Contact from Planet Clermer, Possibilities of the Infinite. Um, hang on, let me just get rid of this. And, uh, and you will see that it was uh, written by Rodolfo uh, Castellato and Wendell Stevens, right? So then, uh, and then I tell you where you can go and get it because see all of these Wendell Stevens books are no longer in print. They're very hard to even get on Amazon. And if you were to get one on Amazon, it probably cost a thousand bucks, right? So you can go to ufophotoarchives.com and Wendell's daughter has all the books there in a PDF format. So if people were interested in reading more about it, or they could buy all the books, I think she has them for sale for like 160 bucks or something, right? 
So there's those kinds of things. Another, a few of my other favorite races were the Clarions, which are these beautiful, beautiful beings. This is Nelfa. Nelfa's picture is in the uh, book. Um, she, uh, her job is she's an astrobiologist and chrono astronomy dimensional. So it means that she studies uh, the wavelengths and things that are uh, between the dimensions and the biologies that are in each dimension. And they are, they keep tracks of the resonance to make sure that everything is in an equilibrium, right? So that's one of the things. Um, there's another male being named Sewell. That, that photograph, I've seen those photographs online. Yes. There's a, there's yeah. a few, that's actually a real photograph. That's a real photograph, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and they're beautiful, yeah. aren't they? They're beautiful. And another, you know, when they when these beings come, uh, the um, uh, the contactee before was a South African woman named um, Elizabeth Clarer, K-L-A-R-E-R. Uh -huh. And um, she is a star seed from, um, I think it's, uh, I think it's Alpha Centauri. I think that's where the clarions come from. So at a certain point, she came in contact with a man that was a clarion and he explained that she was his wife back there and that she had left on a starseed mission. And they sort of rekindled their love ship and she became pregnant. And he took her to Clarion to live during her pregnancy and to have the baby there, which was a boy. And the boy had to live there because of what, because of the, um, uh, physical nature of his body he wouldn't survive on earth mm -hmm. so then she came back and she lived the rest of her days out on earth there's wonderful interviews with her she's a very classy woman um so where she, where is clarion you know it's uh i believe it's an alpha centauri oh, oh i can actually here i'll tell you right now let me just so what i'm getting when you're speaking about this is that their gravity system is completely different and if the body of that being came here it would our gravity would crush them no i'm sorry they're from aquila aquila, aquila. That? yeah it's um it's let's see it revolves around two suns in a binary system in the constellation Aquila. So you'd have to look on a star map. This is information that is from Maurizio Cavallo. He's an Italian mm -hmm. man. He has been in contact with the Clarions. He's the one who took these photographs. Right. He's been in contact with them for quite some time. He also showed me a photograph, uh, which, which I did not publish of a human um, Venusian um, mm -hmm. who is a time space, um, he, he deals with time and space uh, uh, is his job. You know, the, the coordinates between time and space and all different kinds of things like that. So there were physical clarions living on the planet on because our planet. On yeah. our planet, yes. And there are many from other races because they look like us, okay. you know, that kind of thing. I don't know if Nelfa could get away with it because she's so unique looking. She looks like a beautiful doll, you know, but there are other clarions like Sewell. Sewell, there's a photograph of Sewell in the book. Um, uh, and some of the other clarions also look very close to us, but a lot of them look very close to Nelfa. You know, they're, they're like, they have these perfection features. So, so where did he take that photograph of her? On I a... don't know, because it looks like these were probably taken on a craft up close. Because, I'm getting on a ship, on a because ship. Because everything in the photographs is like this. Right. So, so I'm sure that that's uh, where you know, where that happens. That so, photograph, that they're just confirming that they were taken on, on, on the ship and uh, they said, yeah. you know, that because I asked when I was looking at the photographs before. So interesting, interesting. Um, 
Okay, so I had Sue Walker on in our Inner Sanctum group recently, who, who is a communicator for the Ponti, who are a group right. of uh, grey extraterrestrials. Have you got the Ponti in your book? I do not. No, well, they I do not. are humanoid grey, so they call themselves humans, but they come I, from I, the I, I do know about them. So, yes, they had a reticuli yes, too. I do. And she said that in the 70s, and this, this goes back to when we talk about Valiant Thought. This goes back to something that was going on with him. In the 70s, the uh, Galactic Federation and the and the people that oversee the governments of Earth, oversee Earth, I can't say it's the US government, um, made a commitment, a, what's the word I'm looking for? A document that they would a, not- A treaty, like a treaty. treaty. Thank you, yeah. a treaty. <laughs> that they would not interfere with Earth for 50 years. So that there was a few, there was a whole lot of protocols in place, which I don't, I'm not privy to all of them. But one of them was that they weren't allowed to be videotaped or photographed and so Sue, who's an artist, draws them all. But that treaty right. finishes like in a couple of weeks. Oh, wow. Well, that's yeah. very cool. August. This, why we're in August now. So it finishes this month. So I'm well, it'll be wondering. Interesting. It'll be interesting to see what transpires. It'll, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, obviously, that photograph and other photographs are there because of, they've happened. But, you know, for the most part, they just, the ET said, well, we'll leave you guys alone to sort of sort it out for yourself and we won't interfere too much. And, uh, you know, they'll personal contact like yours, obviously, and many yes. others, but not this global exposure, disclosure. So that- Right, uh, uh, that's what the Starseed program and other programs like that are in place for, to get the population consciously ready right. for it it's not that's why they're not landing but you'll see you know everyone has a camera now so right everyone can photograph it everyone there is no more underground photos like there used to be back in the day when there weren't cell phones or things i mean there are so many uh things i mean i i had a producer uh catch a after after he uh, worked on Stranger or, or saw Stranger at the Pentagon, you know, I was like, all you gotta do is look up. He captured a craft uh, with his cell phone, an agent in town captured a giant donut silver shaped craft just hanging in the sky. Right. Right. So, I mean, all these things exist. I mean, um, they're just everywhere. If you look up, and, and a lot of times, too, is if you do want to see them, you can go somewhere where it is wide and open, and you can meditate, and you can invite the, um, I would always say, uh, the uh, spiritually-minded, um, fully conscious beings uh, if they want to come and, and appear in their ship and let it be known that they're there, right? And um, a lot of times that will happen. You always want to sort of say it in, in those things so you don't attract a negative ship um, because there are people who have had really bad experiences with negative ships. So I think there's um, some sort of protection uh, because Earth is so <laughs> unconscious and young in their consciousness that they're like the the bad dudes aren't allowed to really interfere with us they they are hang on one second let me i'm going to get one thing to show you hold on all right so uh with that very thing um i you know i was thinking the same thing and i was like it would be really great to just have a symbol of protection and that kind of stuff and so um I work with angels all the time, and uh, and I've actually met my ministering angel. I I pleaded for years and years, and it took twenty years, and finally showed up. You know, he was a African American man, uh, or no, he wasn't. I, he was not American. I believe he was um, from Africa, and his name was Jeremy. And so I got to meet him and. Uh, on the inner, 
But I also had a visitation from Michael and he gave me this to create. And it's called the Universal Seal of Protection. And there are three M's there, the divine M's, the uh, cobalt blue is for Michael. The, uh, the gold M is for the Arch Archangel Metatron. And the silver M is for Melchizedek. So it's the divine M Trinity. And uh, anyway, so once I created these, um, there were uh, certain uh, things that people were experiencing that were negative and I sent them the cards and everything just sort of vanished. So, um, so anyway, it was just, uh, you know, for me, it was just great. And um, so I use these a lot. All my friends have them. Um, I have them on the autobiography of a extraterrestrial website under other books where the ET Almanac is. So um, anyway, but going back to the ET Almanac, right? So, so as I'm writing the book, um, I get a phone call from a woman in Canada who tells me she's my fourth or fifth cousin and that she's a genealogist and she wants some information and we're related through my mother's father. So we have a great long conversation and I said, I said, you know, uh, I learned when I was 12 that my father was my stepfather and I have a biological father out there, could you find him? And I said, all I have is a name. And she said, yes, I can. So anyway, I, uh, she contacted me sometime later and she said, I found him. He uh, passed away in 2006. This is like 1999, by the way. And uh, this is where he's buried. So I said, I'm going to the cemetery tomorrow. So I went down to the cemetery and I said, um, uh, did anyone call? Do you have a person's name and maybe uh, contact info when my biological father died? when they brought him here. And she looked in and she goes, yes, we do have a name of a man, but we don't have any contact info. So I came home, I looked the guy up, 74 year old man living around the corner from me, literally. And so I wrote him a letter. He had a different last name than my biological father. So I just wrote a letter, explained it. And I put a picture of myself in there. Two days later, I get a phone call from this man's son who said, my dad got your letter. And I said, oh, I said, was he like his best friend or whatever? He goes, no, actually it's his half brother. And I said, oh, so you're my cousin. And he goes, yeah, I guess I am. He said, but what's really weird is you're a doppelganger for him. And so I met them for dinner and an hour into the conversation, you know, my uncle is just staring at me like, I can't believe this. I can't believe this. You know, you look so much like him. And um, he, an hour into dinner, I'm just saying, tell me everything about him and blah, blah, blah. And he says, oh, by the way, you know, uh, he was in the Air Force and he worked in Project Blue Book. Right? So that was mind blowing. And then I find out after that, that when he left the Air Force, came back here, he went to work at Warner Brothers and was uh, head of construction for movies and TV. So we kind of have these similar paths, which is really strange. And, uh, but we were actually connected through real DNA. Uh, when did he die? 2006. Hang on. You said he died in 2006, but you contacted yes. his brother in 1999. 2000. Yeah, in uh, 2019. That's what 2019. I 2019. Okay. 2019, because that's when I was writing this book and oh, it so all was really, happening so during happened, the writing of the book. Oh, that happened really recently that you found. Yeah, recently, your uncle. yeah. Mm -hmm. 2019. Okay, okay. I was a little confused about that. Okay, so he died in 2006. Yes. Uh, how old was he when he died? 
Uh, 71. Okay. And he was your doppelganger. Have you chatted to him in spirit? Oh, yeah. He comes around a lot. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Um, just lots of regrets. Really? Yeah. Lots of regrets, you know. Uh, he didn't, you know, he didn't come around. It, it's a long story, but another book. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's not a book, but <laughs> you know, whatever happened between him and my mom was, you know, the thing that sort of may uh, go away, you know. So anyway, um, but uh, yeah, so that was really fascinating. So I dedicated the book to him. Uh huh. And, you know, sort of told the story in the book as well. So, uh, yeah, so, so this is all the information came from lots of these different connections and things of that sort. Um, also, um, I've met many hybrids mm -hmm. along the way. There are so many hybrids on this planet. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was able to talk to them about obscure, like the, the, the races that they're from, their obscure races and things like that, like the mantis beings. Well, and, the mantis, that's the, you've just read my yeah, story. And so that was yeah. the next thing. I, I, talk, to, talk to us about the mantis. What do you know about the mantis? Well, there, there's so many different, um, so many different vibrations shall we say, of the mantis. And, and they supposedly go way back into uh, the creation of the universe and things of that nature. But it's always been in the UFO community and world a little bit of an enigma because everybody is like, well, what do you know about the mantis beings? And what do you know about the mantis beings? And nobody was really ever clear people would have an experience with them and usually they were all positive. Right. But in some abduction scenarios, they were in the background either observing, right? Mm -hmm. or, or making sure it was going as planned, right? So, so, and in these abduction scenarios were, were these against those abductions will or not against their will, right? So there's, there's cases, um, I'll give you one, one case. Uh, it's a very famous case. Um, and he's a lovely human being. Um, it's the Pascagoula incident. And, um, he was um, brought on board and it was some of the most horrendous things that happened to him that he won't even discuss to this day. He won't even open up about uh, anything, right? The same with Travis Walton. His experience was not a good experience. He was terrified and frightened. And a lot of new information has come out on his through Jennifer Stein, who put out, you should have her on the show. She's, she's a Walton expert, and she's the one that has the new, uh, the new documentary out with Travis, of course, with Travis's blessing, about all the things that he now remembers through recall of going under of what exactly happened on the craft, right? So, um, but in hindsight, he realizes that they were fixing him because he got bad radiation from the craft. And if they hadn't brought him on board and kept him, them, kept him there for the six or seven days, because they had this light thing on him, which was probably absorbing the radiation, he would have died, right? So. So although his was horrifying in the moment, lots of people's are horrifying, but uh, you know, the Pascagoula incident, his was- uh, Very horrifying. Horrifying. So, as you were talking before, when we started talking about the mantis, I got this really high pitch in my ear, which made me feel kind of dizzy for a second. Uh, and they just say to me, you humans don't really understand, you know, you have such judgment over good, negative and positive. 
experiences and many of the negative experiences that you deem as negative are in service to you they're actually mm -hmm. in service to you so you've just said that with travis for instance they brought him on board he was having horrifying experiences but they were just trying to help him because he'd had some radiation yes from, yeah yes. and um and even in life, Craig, you know, like some of the worst experiences that have happened in my life have been some of the best experiences. So what we deem as terrible experiences actually can happen for our conscious evolution sure. rather than Absolutely. there to torture us. You know, like dad beat me up as a kid and mom dies of cancer and, you know, all these terrible things that happen. But in hindsight, I planned all of it. And I learned through all of it. And it's the same when we're having experiences with extraterrestrials. Uh, although they do have a very different consciousness, many, many of them, to us. So they don't have the emotional bodies that we have. Uh, yeah. So they're mm -hmm. what they deem as totally fine, we deem as horrific. Yeah. There and it is until you really understand the inner makings of, of all of the different races, because some are void of emotions, right? Right, and some want to experience emotions, so they start a hybrid program to start breeding right. human DNA into their mm -hmm. own race, or um, you know, some races are more clinical, some are more scientific, some are more like this. And how they explain to me is all the planets throughout the universe are all schools. We're all going to school. Here we're learning duality. We're learning to master our emotions because when we master the emotions, this is when we activate our 12 chakras and we start to become fully conscious, right? And then right. we start becoming, so a lot, a lot of people, uh, the beginning stages are you become very highly attuned. You become very psychic. You start connecting in to that. You start, you know, you start seeing and feeling, and then you can start seeing and feeling what's coming at you yeah. from, family and friends and different things. And then you have to learn a whole new set of skills in the protection arena and building shields and, you know, little things like that. So um, you know, speaking about the hybrid program or the star seeds, uh, Stephen Simon, I was telling you about, just had a chat with him for the show, produced a film with Neil Donald Walsh and James Twyman called Indigo. Have you ever seen that film? I did a long time ago, yeah. Right. And mm -hmm. so there's these kids and they're doing exactly what you're saying. Like they have complete access to what's going to happen next. They're on the grid. They're on the sort of, you know, internet of the mind, talking to each other through time and space. And it, it's mm -hmm. such a great little film. Uh, Neil Donald Walsh actually stars in it. He, he does a bit of an acting role in the film, which I think is funny, but uh, plays his hand at being the actor. But yeah, and it's, it's just exactly what you're talking about. Um, such a great film. It's not really that yes. well made. It has all the violins in it, you know, like daytime television movies. It was made in the 80s. Right. So it feels very daytime television, 90s daytime television. <laughs> but anyway. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it's, uh, I remember it being a, a, a really fun film to watch, you know, learning, like a learning film. Well, absolutely. So, and it's still so pertinent today. Like it was made all those years ago, like over 40 years ago, but it's still so pertinent today with uh, the new kids coming in. So that little girl, you know, who was like, I don't know, 10 in the film, what, she's like 50 now or something or anyway. Um, okay. <laughs> Let's go back to Stranger at the Pentagon. Have we said all sure. we want to say about the almanac? About the I think so, yeah. People, if they want to get autographed copies from me, they could go to autobiography of on anet.com and you click on other books and then there's the book there and then there's the, um, the uh, universal seal cards. And then I have another funny book of a movie I cast 25 years ago called The Silence of the Hams companion book because I cast every major funny motion uh, 
picture star from Mel Brooks to Dom DeLuise to Phyllis Diller. Everybody's in this movie. So I did a companion book, The Silence of the Hams. It was a spoof on horror films. (laughs) So... I mean, everyone was in it. Martin Balsam from Psycho, Shelley Winters. I mean, I got everyone in it. So so I did a companion book because they just re-released the film on Blu-ray and they did a documentary with all of us and everything. So I, my agent got a small publisher to pick up the book and that kind of thing. So, so anyway. So, uh, Stranger at the Pentagon, I read the book in the 90s. I really resonated with it. I, I saw, when I saw the picture of Valiant Thor, it, it, just, uh, it just hit me, you know, and it just stayed with me. And my casting partner uh, back then, she's since passed away. She, she always told me about these friends of hers who lived in Arizona and that they were very much into UFOs and they see them all the time in Arizona and they've had experiences. And she wanted me to meet them. And, and they were much older. I think she was in her 70s when I met her and the husband was in his 80s. Um, and he lived to be a hundred. So, yeah. And um, so they came out and they came to the office and the wife, she was just, she just reminded me of Mrs. Santa Claus. And she had this sweet little Southern accent, you know, she says, well, you know, Craig, our good friend, Dr. Frank. And I was like, and I just looked at her and I said, are you talking about Dr. Frank strangers? And she goes, yeah, you want to meet him? And I went, Yeah, (laughs) you know, it was just like out of the blue. And I literally was sitting in a restaurant with Dr. Frank the next week for hours on end, me being a fan and just listening to his stories. And I thought that would be it, right? And we, you know, he ended up calling me and, and we just developed this like brotherly father son kind of relationship. I talked to him every day until he died. I saw him at least once or twice a week. And he had told me all the perils of him trying to get the movie made over the years and the things that have happened. And then about two or three months into me knowing him, he said somebody had called him and wanted to make it into a movie. And since I was in the film business, would I come to the meeting so he doesn't get taken again, right? And so anyway, I at the end of the meeting and after having a further conversation with the person, I told Dr. Frank, you're not going to get involved with this person, right? And, and I saw how sad he was. And, and I explained to him, I said, you know, the book is vignettes of stories. So there's really not a thorough thing there to write a story, you know, and, and I said, I'm going to prove it to you. And so I wrote like all the different things in the book. And of course, as I'm writing, I'm seeing this woman who was in my mind internet, who just popped in one day, I never forgot her. She had red hair. She was in a powder blue um, uniform right form fitting she was very voluptuous she had porcelain white skin bright green eyes and red hair to about here and she was standing in front of a a silver craft and she was beaming just beaming right and all of a sudden this woman pops back in my head after like a 10-year absence as i'm writing this and she's like oh and then she's talking to me oh, and you could do this here and you could do this there and you could do this. And and so I start thinking, oh, I guess I could craft something out of this. And and so I started writing, I started learning about the crew. And so I started writing questions for the crew and I would give the things to Dr. Frank and then he would come back because their, their ship is stationed at Lake Mead um, they're, they're, uh, the Victor class saucers are stationed in and around the earth in 200 and I think 87 locations. So it's Victor one, Victor two, Victor three, and so on. Victor one is his flagship. 
where he's stationed with his four vice commanders, Don, Teal, uh, Zan, and um, Thawne. And, uh, and then there's another created being like Valthor named Yanaya, who is from Melchizedek. And then his associate's name is Yeo or Yo, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And so, so he, were, he came back and he said, um, he said, oh, uh, so I went to the ship and um, guess, uh, he said, Teal wanted to say hello to you. And I said, well, who's Teal? And he said, oh, she's a vice commander on the craft, right? And um, I knew that I had heard the name, but I didn't know the functions of what each one did, right? So that's why I was writing the questions. And anyway, he, all of a sudden I started seeing the redheaded woman and I started to describe her and then he would describe a thing and he goes, how do you know what she looks like? And then I explained it to him. And I was like, I, I would assume they connected us somehow. And um, so I was given the task of writing the script and getting everything done. So, so I, I wrote the script. I gave it to Dr. Frank. He, uh, within a few weeks, Val came to him. He said he held it like this absorbed it and said, tell him good job. And I said, um, that's it, no notes. <laughs> so, and he goes, that's all he said. And I said, okay. And then I woke up the next morning, all of the notes are swimming in my head and I couldn't get to the computer fast enough. And so that's how it all went. And so usually it would be Teal who was my um, person, uh, um, who was my point person on the project. And sometimes Dawn would step in as well, uh, one of the other vice commanders. Both are extremely funny. And so it was a very enjoyable experience of which I was already used to because when a master teacher or a fully conscious being would come to me during the writing of Autobiography of an ET, they would share their feeling body with me. And so in the beginning, my body would ring with chills because of their higher vibration. And it would take me time to acclimate. When somebody like a Valiant Thor or a created being does that, you sob for at least 15 minutes until you can acclimate to their energy, right? So I was having the same experiences with them and it is really quite a beautiful experience because you get to write from their perspective and feel what's coming from their heart, yeah. right? So, so I finished it, Dr. Frank passed away. And hey, so I shelved it, yeah. You shelved it. So just, uh, I wanna get back to Dr. Frank. Yeah. But just tell people, you know, who Valiant Thor is, because for those who don't know the story, like who is that you say he's a creative being, uh, he gave you his notes telepathically and he shared his energy with you and all that. Like who, who is he? So Valiant Thor, a uh, created being is what we would call an angel in human form, right? There are different classifications Although the classification on Valiant Thor was never disclosed, I always believed he was of the seraphim, right? So he's not an extraterrestrial then you're saying? No, no. Well, they don't consider themselves extraterrestrials. They say, if you want to do that, then you're extraterrestrials to us. We're all just the cosmic family living on different planets, having different, gaining different experiences and well, learning different things. So, but terrestrial uh, denotes that there is a terrain, a terrestrial d terrain, whereas angelic beings don't come from a physical terrain. They right. Come from the, a, they come, they're in the celestial realm. Celestial so terrain. So, you, you can talk to Mark Sims about that. Okay. Um, because he sat with Tejbar for 13 days, a celestial, and he knows all about those, that realm. So, he could be of great assistance to you and your audience with that.
So you're saying that so, Valiant Thor didn't come from a, another planet, another terrestrial planet. He came from a spiritual realm into... I, I would say that. I don't know that. I don't know. I can't give you a definitive answer. I can okay. only give you what my intuition says. Okay. I believe he comes from the angelic realm. They are created beings. They can create a body at will, mm -hmm. right? He is in the body that he chooses for us to also see him in, right? I, I also, there, there are two other cases that were similar to this, George Van Tassel, when he met a, a higher realm being named Solgonda, the being looked similar and said that this was what would make him to be the most comfortable looking at, Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Not to say that that's not what they look like, Right. But if you're in a if you are in a higher realm, they are able to do different things. So he could be in many different bodies in the oh, different yeah. dimensions. Right. So yeah. Yeah. here, this is what the way I think that he chooses to uh, represent himself to the himself. human race. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, so he, came in, he came into a created body which looks human. So on the street, you wouldn't know the difference. That's but right. up up close, do you want to tell us? Well, if you're around, if you're around somebody like that, I mean, they can veil you to even them standing next to you if they wanted, um, or if they want you to see them, you would, if you looked at them and they looked at you, you would feel them look right through your eyes and into your soul and you would know that they are reading your entire soul history and it is a experience that is both beautiful and to some a little frightening because they see the bad bits as well but they don't care about the bad bits because they're not judgmental they just see where where you are in your evolution, right? He does not have uh, palm prints, fingerprints at all. He does not have a belly button. So all angels are, are created from the Godhead. They can just be how I understand it through my guides is that it can either happen if, if the Godhead... Well, I call it the Godhead. I, I, you know, I look at the entire mass, all energy in all the universes is one, is all of us. So I, I still call it the Godhead, but it's not just one person. It's not that. But if it needs a, a created being for some particular uh, maybe sector of the universe, because a lot of these created beings are assigned sectors of the universe to oversee and to be a play, a person where world can go to when in conflict and when seeking answers, right? And uh, so, um, so they can be just here, they could be there in, in the other realm and then boom here in a physical body, or some are created and this is a what they what they explained to me as a cosmic um, uh, like uh, celebration is that a being will be born from a womb of light, a, a real birth baby, and this baby will be given to advanced parents to raise for a particular mission. Right, so. So there are uh, various different uh, things there, but uh, he, uh, he came uh, here in, in a nutshell, Valiant Thor came on March 16th, 1957. Um, it was pre-arranged meeting. And uh, so they knew he was coming and he met with Eisenhower, Nixon, the rest of the brass. It was a Saturday morning. And uh, he was put on VIP status. Uh, he lived in an apartment below the Pentagon. 
um, through Dr. Frank, I've met many of the old retired generals who told me what the downstairs of the Pentagon was like down to, you know, even a water fountain on a wall that was purple that everyone used to dip their fingers in and make the sign of the cross, you know, because they were in a place <laughs> that was very unusual, we'll just say. So, um, so anyway, so he was there and, and what he came with was a divine design to help eliminate uh, sickness, disease, poverty, to prolong life, um, to talk to them about atomics because again, of uh, it, knocking our planet a little off its axis, what it was doing to the other planets in our solar system, what it was doing interdimensionally. Again, think about what NELFA does, right? They're always calculating these things to make sure a perfect equilibrium so that all beings can live a perfect equalized life. Because uh, if these things go off balance, then it then it sets everything off balance. So, um, and uh, and you know, talk about many things, free energy, all of those things. Which um, he was there for three years to discuss it, and um, he uh, you know he talked and met with uh, many people while he was there. He he uh, was there at the beginning stages of NASA as well. Um, that was just getting going. Dr. Frank told me he, he did, uh, he knew that he did help with the regulation of the spacesuits because the astronauts kept getting uh, really, really sick. Um, he healed a pilot once who had bleeding ulcers. He didn't know the man. He was just walking down the hall. He stopped, said hello, put his hands on his stomach and his head. And the man was uh, grounded and was going to have an operation. And he suddenly felt better, had them recheck, and it was all gone. This man actually, um, I have his name uh, somewhere. I just found it the other day. He came to one of Dr. Frank's lectures in the 90s and told Dr. Frank that he was that man that William Thor healed, which I thought was, you know, wow. really amazing. So... It's it's such a huge story. There are so story. many so many things. He he came like the the ETs and the celestial beings are knocking themselves out, trying to help raise the consciousness of humanity. Yes, and really absolutely. Knocking. And so he came in the late fifties to mm -hmm. help, and yes. the powers that oversee our world said no, no thanks. You know, well, we don't well, want your technology. We don't want your energy technology because it's going to destroy our economy. And so there was, was this, yeah. And so there was this almighty pause on the advancement of the human race up until right. now. Up until now, but also just so you know that Eisenhower and Nixon, who was vice president, were both for his proposal. Right. And we know this even, Dr. Frank told me this, but we also know it because uh, the military industrial complex was just getting its, uh, its legs. And right. Eisenhower in his goodbye speech talked about the dangers of the military industrial complex. Right. So, right. so um, you know, so there was all of that. So, so I, you know, I am still trying to raise the money to make the, the big feature film. I, I know, I've heard you will say, be, yeah. you won't go to the studios. And, and Stephen and I no. talked about this too, because st studios are about money and they have this, you know, they've got this sort of like, um, it's got to be violent, it's got to be this, and you want to honour Dr. Frank, Dr. S Frank Stranger's vision yes. and, and the studios that make the big blockbusters will not honour it. So... Right, right. Be money behind it that will yeah. actually honor it as it was given to both of you, really. As um, it was. And, and there were some dark elements when he was there as well. Yeah, he, know, was, that are he was on that Earth. Are incorporated. <laughs> so, <laughs> we talk but, about dark ETs, the dark yeah. ones of the humans. The yeah. Ones that are so, dark. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway, it, but still, 
it's it's you know what's great about it is we're going to be half in space learning about them and half down here as well so this is a very big wonderful project that will help with um you know raising consciousness and everything as well and if people haven't seen the short film it's on amazon prime or they can watch it on the website stranger at the pentagon.com I watched it on Vimeo because I, I, in Australia, there's a lot of stuff on Prime that we can't see for some reason. Oh, it's true. Yeah, here they won't let us put it on. They only let us put it here and in England. Um, they won't let us put it in other countries unless we go and get all the tax credits and all of that. And it's like so expensive to do all that. I mean, uh, you right. have to get like tax ID numbers and all kinds of crazy stuff. So. Yeah, it's a great little film, but I still thought when I was watching it, I'd love to see this made like really. Oh, yeah. You yeah. know, like, yeah, anyway. Uh, um, but yeah. You too. Uh, <laughs> you too. So um, <laughs> basically what happened was there was this big pause and then obviously, like, like we were talking about, there was this treaty that happened in the 70s, obviously the beginning of the 70s that said, okay, we're going to leave you alone for 50 years and not really push it too hard. And then after that, all bets are off. And, and that finishes August now. That finishes right. now. Right. Uh, so, um, yeah, all bets are off. Like we've let you slumber and we've let you do what you needed to do with your energy systems and your consciousness and your technology. And, and uh, so they've got so much to bring us. I think the consciousness technology is the most important part. But as we shift our consciousness, everything else changes. Because when you understand everything. you're the power, you're your own power source, you're the power of healing, you're the power of creation, then you're not reliant on, you know, these things that we think are outside ourselves to give us what we want. Like what we're going through on this global in this global crisis is this mm -hmm. health thing. Like you've had your own healing. When you understand yes. that no matter, it doesn't, you can't be scared of a virus or a or something that's going to get you because if you understand your power and you understand how to acclimate your body to the healing and sure yeah. that's right mm -hmm. yeah oh absolutely you, you want to chat we've been talking for an hour and a half already it's gone so quickly <laughs> i know right <laughs> you want to talk about your own healing what happened with you well um i would say i it was uh there's something that I can't eat and I ate it, right? So you had an allergic uh, reaction. You so, allergic mm, I don't know if it was an allergic reaction, but I, my stomach didn't feel right. The next day, my stomach didn't feel right. The third day, my stomach felt really awful. And I was literally bedridden for three days. And finally, I called a good friend of mine and I said, look, you got to come and get me and take me to the doctor. So they, she did. And um, they gave, they were giving me things for my stomach. I was still so sick. And they said, you know, we're going to put you in an ambulance and send you to the hospital. So they did that. And um, the, I finally was uh, ad admitted. I was in my room. I think my friend left around 11 o'clock, something like that at night. Um, I went to sleep. And somewhere in the early morning hours, um, I woke up in the twilight, you know, where you're half awake, half asleep. And I felt teal standing over me. And I could feel her hand moving across me. But I also started feeling lots of really tiny bubbles going through my intestines. Wow. Because what, what they had said was, is I, uh, they had done x-rays and said I had a bowel obstruction and they were going to have to right. operate the next day. Right. right. So, and as anyone knows, no one wants them messing with your intestines, right? Because <laughs> you don't know if they're going to put it back right. So anyway, um, so I just knew I would be okay in the morning. And so I 
kind of fell back to sleep. And then I woke up, I was kind of like on my side and I looked over and sitting in the chair was Dr. Frank. And he goes, Teal called me early this morning and told me to get down here and tell you she fixed you up last night. And I this went, is, this she is Dr. Did. Frank. This is Dr. Frank. Dr. Frank. This is not him. In, in yeah, spirit. no, so this, physically, this happened, physically. Yeah. He's yeah, come yeah. over to your house and said, I got to, I got to give. No, Craig he's come to the hospital. Oh, he's come, oh you're in hospital, right. I'm okay. in the hospital. He's come to the okay. hospital. So, yeah. so anyway, I had them, uh, you know, do another x-ray and I walked out of there that, um, you know, that very uh, afternoon. So. Needless to say, I was a very happy camper and I've never eaten that food since. Interesting. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but amazing. This this knowledge, this technology, this knowledge that they have, if they give that to us, and I am sure they are giving it to us in many energy healing courses that are on the planet. I've done many of them. Yeah. Uh, you know, it totally wipes out the allopathic medical industrial complex, doesn't it? Totally wiped out the pharmaceutical industry. It, I mean, like well, well, if you get into the bigger picture, to keep the planet dumbed down and not allow people to activate their fully conscious bodies, because when you are fully conscious, you can heal anything. You don't get sick. You okay. don't get any of those things. Right. right? So. So then if everyone starts changing and becoming fully conscious and it takes over the planet, they lose control of the planet. And, and when it turns to, when it tilts in the direction of the light, they can no longer sustain being here in their dark energies and have to vacate. And they don't want to lose a planet because of its resources. Right. Many resources. <laughs> so yeah but yeah it, you know not that i buy into the war against the light and dark but i do agree i do know that the shift is going to happen whether they like it or not mm -hmm. it's going to happen because it's just the plan i mean it's been delayed because i had a girl on the show a few years ago a gorgeous young girl who had an astral adventure in a parallel earth and what had happened when the craft crashed during the late 40s and the early 50s, they, um, as they've done in the industrial complex, you know, the, the um, space programs, they back engineered some of the technology, but they released it to the public and it became known, like the disclosure happened back then. Basically, they didn't cover up. They didn't do the cover up. And so this right. world evolved along those lines of having this knowledge from extraterrestrial beings and craft that they implemented in earth and so she she went to this parallel world where it had evolved from that point in in our timeline it was like 2018 i think i spoke to her and it was this utopian world it was a modern thriving hub there was no money everything was free there was incredible technology there was amazing mm -hmm. health so, yes. So taken by her experience because yeah, yeah, like that—that that was a probable future for this Earth, which went right. down a timeline line and happened, but right. in another parallel world. It yeah, will. but it it will be this world's um, destiny again, uh, ultimate as well. destiny. Yeah, Absolutely. ultimate destiny. Yeah. This this timeline right here is a more difficult one. Uh -huh. And it is for all the beings involved to learn from it and to gain knowledge and uh, all of that. And then, and then uh, when we're back in our, our fully conscious selves, we'll be sharing that information with uh, other, other worlds world. and other things and right. that kind of things because we'll have a unique perspective. Absolutely. You know, what I wanted to ask you about Dr. Strange is how long ago did he leave his body? Uh, November 18th, 2008. Have you been yakking with him since? Uh, he does come around every once in a while. I haven't, I haven't, I've felt him, but I haven't heard him. Um, okay. 
for a while. So I know he's been very busy, whatever he is doing over there. Uh, but uh, sometimes several years after he passed, a lot of my friends that knew him would say, you know, this sounds really weird, but I felt Dr. Frank around me this morning. I was like, I'm sure it was him. He was just coming to say hi. He yeah, like exactly. Yeah. You know, so well, yeah, I, I really miss him. I just miss him so much. It's I was going to so say, you know, how does he think about what's happening with the progress of the, maybe you should sit in meditation and have a good old yarn with him and yeah, <laughs> <laughs> get some pointers, you know, because from that perspective, they've got a lot more, you know, a broader perspective, haven't they, of, of, uh, of everything from our perspective, yes. from our linear human physical perspective, we don't have as yeah. broader height, really. Of, right, um, right what's possible because yeah it would be great to see this movie made professionally and and uh, yeah so on Netflix uh, all, or wherever all you yeah or all you millionaires out there call me <laughs> so it, it's a <laughs> because money everything's thing, ready it? it's, it's really just a money thing everything is ready you know i've been casting actors in movies for over 30 years i've been writing producing directing i mean the entire script is ready we have the whole crew ready i have well, uh, well he, here's, a here's, the cast ready. here's a here's a thought for you craig we have a thriving movie industry in australia and new zealand actually yeah and for americans with our dollar it's a lot less expensive when you bring your yeah. dollar over here to make movies down right. under whether in australia yeah. or new zealand uh yes. so bring it come on down we've got a i would every, love to we, i worked in the movie industry for years catering mostly but you know in the art department and i sewed clothes and i put makeup on people and everyone says it comes from overseas so many people come like i did a lot of korean and asian commercials they all come to make their commercials uh that the crews here are just fabulous they're really yeah great crews the the people that work in the movie industry they're really diligent hard-working honest you know happy yes. go lucky people but um like with anything with covid the movie industry has taken a big hit too because we're we've yeah. been in lockdown for six weeks now we're here for another another month so we're not yeah. supposed to be out there making movies but um yeah bring it down under and make it down under fox studios just up the road <laughs> i love to <laughs> Well, we'll we'll hold that vision. We'll hold that yes. vision. Go talk to Frank and ask him what he thinks. Okay, I will. <laughs> <laughs> oh, darling, well, I should let you go. I've been talking for an hour and oh, it was so now. much fun. Thank you for having me on. Your story is just amazing. Uh, I heard you talk on another show about the day the Earth stood still, funded by the yeah. U.S. government to see what people would think. Yeah. You said. One of my right. favorite all-time movies, and I often quote that on the yeah. show. Uh, there's yes. a line in the show, I think it's well in both movies, but I remember the Keanu Reeves one, where he's talking to the scientist and the scientist um, and the, the alien is saying, well, we have to get rid of the humans because they're killing the planet. And the scientist says, don't get rid of them yet. You know, it's not until we're pushed to the edge, pushed to the pre precipice that we change. Right. And I remember the first time I heard that line in that movie, it might have been the first movie, I thought, well, that's not true. Change without being pressed. And now I'm older and I look at humanity at large, I'm thinking, oh, that's actually very true. Like humans yeah. just don't change until you push them to the very edge and then they say, okay, I'll we'll change. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. I heard, um, I'll leave you with this wonderful um, quote from Albert Einstein. The mind is like a parachute. It only works if we keep it open. Open. How's that? I love that. I love that. <laughs> you know, I didn't get around to talking the principle behind thoughts. So that was something else that you said on another show. Oh, yes. That's a whole, yeah, that's a whole big thing from the Maram I Am race, you know, from the great I Am. But all of those, there, those teachings and things are uh, in, in the, the book. book. So there's book one. Uh, there's book two. A lot of those teachings are in book one and book two. Uh, book three is one of the most fascinating there um, because it not only goes into the duality of, of uh, 
everyone's your own life and how to do that, but it goes into the greater re duality of the universe of Archangel Michael and Lucifer. And it goes into um, who these people actually, uh, well, who he was, where he went wrong and all of that. So book three, uh, Tehran's dossier is, Tehran had to do a dossier on it for, um, uh, Lucifer had been on, has been on a prison planet for 200,000 years and he has refused redemption. And then when Tehran goes to interview him, he allows Tehran to interview him and he does go into uh, redemption, but he goes on trial for soul death because of everything. So this goes back to the original hearings. It goes back and forth to the original hearings before he was put on prison planet, to all the things that led him there and to, um, to the final hearing for soul death, um, the tribunals, uh, which are ruled by paradise sons. And it's, in, it's, it's just the most fascinating because when the, they brought me a dark energy one night, it was a shell. And I said, I don't wanna know what that is. And they said, you have to tap into it. Otherwise you can't write the story, right? Mm. So, so I, I, into it? Um, well, I, I did easily, like, like I eased into it. And then once I started to see sort of what it was in, in making these two huge figures human, and, and in the sense of, uh, I mean, they're not human, they're both creator gods, but, you know, but the thing is, or created beings, but the difference is, is Michael is also a paradise son where Lucifer is not. So a lot of, there's so many different things that just went into that. And it was just one of the most, fat, I mean, I couldn't wait. I, I literally sat there and wrote that book because I had to know what happened, <laughs> right? And anyway, and then that's uh, book four, so that's the book heroid, four. yeah, the heroid revolution and other warring creatures. So, and all the bad guys are on the back. <laughs> so, <laughs> we we let them have their due on the back cover. So, anyway, um, what what an amazing Netflix series this would be, right? Oh, yeah. I would love that so much. That would just be so amazing. All right. I mean, so everyone listening and watching this, you have to put that yes. intention out there that you want to see yes. it happen. And and the more that you visualize it, seeing it happen, the more it'll happen. That's how creation That's works. Right. Bring that energy right. into physical manifestation by focusing on it. That's yeah, right. That's it, right. It will happen. Oh, Craig, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Karen. It's been You're amazing. A, you're a sweet angel. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sharing your story. It's just, I want to talk more. Let's do this again another time. Oh, we will, for sure. I, yeah. I'm happy to do it again. Be fabulous. Thanks yeah. again. You're welcome, sweetheart. Thank you. Incredible. Incredible. Incredible information, isn't it? Incredible. Wouldn't you love to see all those books as a Netflix, Netflix series or a series? It doesn't have to be on Netflix, I suppose. Uh, yeah, incredible. I haven't actually read the books. I think I'll have to get them. I want to see all the images uh, that he's got in there. Just amazing. I'd love to see the Valiant Thor one, uh, Stranger at the Pentagon, um, made into a professional movie. The little short, I was just chatting to Craig afterwards, as we do. He said that he never actually intended for the short film, which is available on Amazon and Vimeo if you're in Australia and other countries from Amazon, uh, America. Uh, he never intended it to be a public. He just made it as a, like a sizzle reel to, to sort of sell it to people for the bigger movie. Uh, so, um, so if you look at it like that, it's not sort of, made really professionally to be a it was just a bit of a sizzle reel it's 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 a short movie it's not long and uh the the the, the graphics are great 
some of the graphics are great. They do look a bit cartoonish, but uh, you kind of go that you know they're CG, they're they're computer generated. But but the <laughs> I said to Craig, you think you really where it falls down is the acting. He goes, yeah, I know. Well, if I pay really professional, highly paid actors, it costs you know a hell of a lot more. He said, but they're all professional actors in it. They're all pro but I don't know. As I was watching it, I'm just the acting sort of. It just looks like they're acting. It doesn't sort of look any. Just doesn't really look realistic to me. Anyway, it's a bit like a day, a daytime television sort of telly movie acting. My critical mind. Having worked in the film industry, I'm probably more critical than others. You might really enjoy it. <laughs> don't listen to me. But I'd love to see it made. Uh, Val Thor, Valiant Thor. Funny name, isn't it? Valiant Thor. I said, why did you choose that name? And he said, think about it. Valiant and Thor. I said, yeah, it's a bit funny, really, isn't it? Kind of a funny name. But if you're a creator being that is going to come to earth, you know, and be human, you choose your body, you choose your name, what do you choose? For a purpose, to bring a message. Uh, we didn't go into it, but apparently he, that physical body is still around on the planet. He's still here on the planet doing something. I don't know where he is. Uh, he can come and go at will. I, if he's an angel, I don't know how it all works. But they live outside of physical time and space, what we understand as, as our reality. They just break all the rules of what we think is reality. So... In the movie, uh, in the short movie, he arrives in a spaceship. And as I was watching it, I was thinking, you don't need to arrive in a spaceship. You can just beam me down, Scotty. I mean, you know, that was happening in the 60s and those sci-fi movies. And all that we think is impossible in those sci-fi movies is completely possible when you understand the physics, the laws of the universe. Uh, you don't need to come, you know, in a spaceship. You can just beam down. But I suspect that the whole spaceship landing and the um, people from the United Nations or the governments of Earth, whoever met the spaceship, you know, they needed to see that whole spaceship thing. They couldn't have just some being turn up physically in front of them. They wanted to know where they came from in some spaceship. But it sort of sounds like Valiant Thor wasn't an extraterrestrial. He was a he was a celestial terrestrial, <laughs> you know, dimensional being, celestial being. Anyway, uh, who knows? I'd have to go and have a chat to Mr. Well, I could chat to Thor, couldn't I? Go into meditation and chat to him about who he is. Yep, I can do that. I'll go and have a chat to him. Fascinating information. Just fascinating. Just love Craig. I so love to see that movie being made. Anyway, put it out there. Do you know a multimillionaire that wants to make a movie or a few of them? I said to him, how much do you think it'll cost? And he goes, well, oh, probably about 30 million. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> that much. I guess movies cost a lot to make, don't they? Lots of wages, lots of, lots of bills to pay when you're making movie. I used to work in the film industry. <laughs> I was the least paid person on set. I was the caterer. I was cooking for people. I was earning about $15 an hour and everyone was earning so much more than me. But anyway, it was fun was fun when I was in my 20s and I was studying naturopathy studying healing loved the film industry it's an amazing industry um, and I knew one day that I'd be back there so before I die I bet that I'm going to be on some set making some conscious movies I don't know what exactly but the whole sci-fi you know bringing bringing this information from our extra terrestrial family into cinema into film really does turn me on be great be great you know to not make it so sort of dramatic and uh, negative to make it more positive just showing people's conscious technology healing technology what's possible you know the movies that have healing in them i just love them there are movies like the green mile Have you seen that movie about the the big sort of guy the big big actor and they make him look bigger in the movie and he's completely um, intellectually challenged but he has these amazing healing abilities and he does all these healings in the movie with tom hanks have you seen that movie the green mile there's many movies that depict con you know energy healing like that i just love those movies just can't have enough of those um movies yeah healing 
energy healing consciousness the power of our consciousness because you know these beings that heal us just like he had a being heal him when he was in hospital craig did um, they can teach us how to do that and, and many practitioners are on earth doing that there's a guy that's been reaching out to me or his pa has that he does scalar technology and lots of people use that scalar energy i don't know too much about it he's been reaching out to me for a while i'll we'll have to get back to him and maybe discover it but there's so many energy healing technologies on the planet now in um uh one of my tribe uh, brad you know has a has a teacher reiki teacher he wants me to put him on the show to talk about reiki and um yeah beautiful german guy where does he live i think he lives in england yeah anyway we're, we're going to discuss stuff like that too yeah new world and uh, who, who will, we'll have to wait and see what happens after this month if um, contacts and, um, and more videos and photographs of extraterrestrials come out, you know, after this treaty has finished this month that Sue was talking about. Uh, they left us alone for a while and now they're, um, no, you know, no, hold, no holding back anymore. Okay, let's go, guys. Let's get this Let's get this world back on track. Back on track. The cat's been sitting here next to me the whole time. Before when Craig was talking, the cat was running around the house like a mad thing. He could feel the energy. He could feel all the extraterrestrials in the room with me. The cat's going crazy. All right, I'm going to go. It's late and we've been talking for almost two hours. And uh, thank you so much for watching. And as I said before, Preston Dennett, who is a UFO ET contactee and, and researcher, prolific in his information. He's going to come into the inner sanctum this month, August, and chat to our little tribe. I ask Craig to come on next month, ne next year, next year, because I'm booked out until the end of the year, maybe to come in and chat to our, because there's so much to talk about, so much to talk about. Um, and he said he'd love to do that. So Preston's coming in. We're going to chat with Preston and I'm on week. I'm online every week talking about consciousness and healing and deliberate creation and all that good stuff, energy healing and psychic ability and channeling. Uh, I've got my mob on tap, said to Craig. I've got access all areas. If I want to talk to someone, I can. Because I said to him, you know, when he was talking, I had him on speaker view, so you couldn't see me much of the time. I was getting this really high pitch coming into my left it wasn't really coming into my ear it was coming into my I don't know it felt like it was on my left and it kind of made me feel like I was going to faint for a second and uh, Craig said oh yeah that's just a different frequency than you're used to and I said that's exactly what I asked I asked what is it that I'm experiencing and they said um, another frequency another consciousness coming to communicate with you during this conversation and they're just acclimating your frequency to theirs and that's why I felt like I wanted to faint for a minute like just for a second I just felt like I wanted to like knock me out and then back online just as they shifted my frequency oh I've had some upgrade or something going on during that conversation with Craig fabulous so I look forward to new communication from new beings more communication from new beings and remember, if you haven't already bought the book, <laughs> buy the book Awakened by Death. Fabulous stories, people's stories in there. One day we'll get the second book out. Don't know when, because I'm never working on it. Just waiting for people to get their stories in. All right. Love you big time. Thanks again for watching and sharing the shows and listening and um, subscribing and all that good stuff. And leave your comments. And if you want to chat to me and uh, other people, you know, we've got a group on Facebook called the Awakened Empowerment Network. Uh, we put that group together for the book, for the Awakened, um, Awakening Soul series, but I just let anyone say anything. People post all their shows on there, other people's shows. I'm not one of these people that is an administrator of a group on Facebook that says, no, you can't do this, play the rules, don't promote yourself. I mean, I just let people do what they want to do. If they spam, you know, if people spam and try and sell you crap, I'll kick them out of the group. But basically, it's a pretty open, free group group for people to talk to each other and post whatever they want to post and other people's shows and I'm very inclusive 
I'll let everyone share their story. It's not just about my show. It's about all of us together, you know, bringing this information out to the public. And uh, yeah, the Awakening Empowerment Network on Facebook. See you later. Love you big time. Bye for now. <laughs>